video. Um, we ask that everyone stay muted um, for the presentation. If you have any questions, you can put those questions in the chat. Um, and we'll get to those uh, as we can. Helen will be monitoring that and, and helping out with that. Uh, let's see. Looks like we're waiting for a couple more people here. And then we'll get started. And thank you for all joining us today. It's a beautiful, beautiful day outside. We're getting some unseasonably warm weather. I know my plants are liking it and I still have tomatoes going, which I'm glad I didn't decide to pull those all out because they're still producing. All right. So just uh, for those that came in a little bit later, we will be recording the session. Um, you will get a recording about a day or two um, after. And um, so if you don't want to be recorded, um, you can turn off your video. And like I said earlier, we do ask that you remain muted for the program and put any questions you have um, in the chat. So I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Helen, uh, who's going to give a little presentation about what the, her department does. Um, and so thank you, Helen, and thank you for joining us, everyone. No problem. Thank you, Vanessa. I, we're really excited to bring this program to you today. Just to let you know, uh, our guest speaker is really excited to hear from you and wants to hear your questions. And he will have uh, breaks or pauses in his presentation. So we'll go ahead and add those questions to the chat uh, as soon as you think of them or even now. And we'll, we're going to be able to ask questions throughout. And uh, so, before, so let me finish so we can hurry up and get started with the good stuff. So uh, my name is Helen Dulac. I work for the city of Dallas in environmental quality and sustainability. And I am super excited to be partnering with the Dallas Public Library Seed Library on this series called Grow With Us. So I'm gonna give you just a little bit of brief information about my department because you've probably never heard of it before. We were formed back in 2004. And back then we were called the Office of Environmental Quality or OEQ. We worked really hard for four years to help the city of Dallas become the first city in the United States to achieve a special environmental certification. And what's remarkable about this is that this was across 14 different departments. We looked at how we could still provide service and have less of an impact on the environment. And that this was Dallas, Texas that did this. It wasn't a city in California. It wasn't a city in Colorado. It wasn't Austin. It was Dallas that achieved this first. And so Dallas is green and we're just trying to go greener. So let's fast forward 10 years where a lot of changes happened to my department. There was a restructuring in the city and we absorbed some other environmental operations and we actually doubled in size. And to reflect that change, we changed our name. And that's when we became Dallas Environmental Quality and Sustainability. Also in 2018, uh, with that merger, we created a combined outreach and engagement team that I'm a proud member of. The following year in 2019, Mayor Johnson created an Environment and Sustainability Committee of City Council. So the main city council meets on Wednesdays at noon, or I'm sorry, Wednesdays, and the first Monday of every month, uh, this Environment Committee meets, and those uh, meetings are virtual. They are open to the public. You can watch those, and it's a great way to get in at the green pulse of the city. Uh, if you have heard of my department, it's probably because on May 27th of this year, we passed the Comprehensive Environmental and Climate Action Plan, known as CCAP. That is the roadmap for the next 30 years of how the city is going to improve the environment for everybody in Dallas and also fight climate change. Uh, what's also remarkable about this is Dallas is one of the few cities in Texas that has a climate plan. Plus, we're one of the few cities not located on the coast that has a climate plan. You can read the entire 250 pages of the plan at dallasclimateaction.com. And uh, even this presentation today goes to one of the goals, which is healthy and local food uh, for everyone. I mentioned that my department doubled in size. What you see in green are what joined us in uh, just a couple of years ago. And I'm gonna talk about one of those just briefly and that is stormwater. So stormwater is anytime water leaves your property. So it can be from the rain or it can even be from your lawn sprinklers or from a hose that was left running. So that water is gonna travel down your, your yard, go into your driveway, go into the street, travel all the way down the street to those big drains at the end of the street. Those drains are called storm drain inlets. And they're there for one reason, and that's to remove the water so the streets don't flood. Well, they do such a good job at that, that they remove that water so quickly, it goes directly into a creek or a stream, which then connects to one of our lakes or the Trinity River. So that means that that water picks up any pollution along the way, such as litter, 
uh, chemicals that were uh, excess chemicals on your lawn, bacteria that was in pet waste, uh, all of that stuff ends up into our lakes and the Trinity River. So we just want you to be mindful about what's going on outside and realize that pollution doesn't necessarily stay in your neighborhood. It can actually end up all the way into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so I mentioned that I'm a member of the outreach and engagement team and we want to empower Dallas to save the earth. And we do that by having virtual presentations like this and in person when we're allowed. If you're in the Dallas, if you're in Dallas, you can invite us to present at your meetings virtually at no cost. We can speak at HOA meetings, different clubs and organizations. We have a lot of information and materials for children anyway, uh, and students from K to college. We also do seminars, activities and different events. If you invite us to talk about, what do we talk about? We talk about environmental topics from A to Z, all the way from air quality to zero waste. Uh, and also, we also hold some events of our own. So just a couple of weeks ago, we had the WaterWise Landscape Tour, and you can actually virtually participate in the tour and visit houses that have no grass. We're talking zero turf homes at savedalluswater.com. So if you ever have any questions for me or anybody on my team, all you need to do is send an email to greendallas at dallascityhall.com and follow us on social media. We are Green Dallas TX on Facebook and at Green Dallas on Twitter and Instagram. And we also have a nifty website called greendallas.net. That's where you can go and fill out the event request form to invite us to speak uh, at your uh, different gatherings and also find out more green tips about the city. And with that, I am super excited to introduce my friend, Jeff Raska, he is with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, and he is the Dallas County Horticulturalist. And he's gonna be talking to us today about raised garden beds. Jeff. All right, thank you, Helen. If we're ready to start the video, or start our little PowerPoint, I wanna thank the city of Dallas, and I certainly wanna thank the Dallas Public Library System for putting this, these venues on. It gives us a chance to expand our knowledge from our university research and gives us a real chance to, to meet with the public and decide what we're going to program on, what's important to you, and what's important for the city of Dallas and Dallas County. So it's a real big opportunity for us to be able to visit with you a little bit. So as Helen mentioned, or as Vanessa mentioned, please ask questions as we're going, and I'll be happy to answer your questions as much as I can. Uh, I will have the website. I will have my actual email at the end where you may email me if you have any issues in, in Dallas County with your gardens. And I, I'm also, not only did I just do this, I'm also uh, over orchards, fruit vineyards, uh, urban backyard chickens. I have a lot of study with urban horticulture, so I've got a lot of things that I teach. So this is uh, this is a great opportunity to talk about raised beds. Raised beds are something we absolutely suggest and we absolutely love to use, and this is the way to go in the future for for future gardening and farming. So we'll go to the next slide, please. Okay, there we go. Raised bed gardening. Uh oh. Okay. Well, when we're talking about raised beds, one thing I want to talk about a little bit to start with is the difference between a raised bed and a container gardening when we're talking about container gardening. Containers are generally just a pot with a good potting mix in it and uh, will have a drainage hole in it, but doesn't use properly, doesn't have much much uh, environmental impact. It's really kind of self-contained unit unless you really overwater, over fertilize, you know, ridiculously and, and really just out over manage and, and poor management, you're not affecting the environment very much. With a raised bed, it's a little different. A raised bed is a, is a contained bordered planting bed without usually a bottom in it. It's actually, it actually is, is reciprocal with the soil, it means that it does have soil exchange of nutrients and water and any chemicals used in that bed will generally get into the soils. So it's a, it's a little different from container is the fact that this does have some environmental impact on our ecosystems. And it's extremely important for us at A&M to make sure we lessen environmental impacts. Our big goal is to grow a lot of food, low impact uh, or low inputs, which means very little fertilization, very little uh, pesticides or, or uh, pest control and water minimize water, very important because of our stormwater systems. I'll talk a little bit about as we're going through it about how we minimize water uh, in our systems. But, uh, it does. What we do is since we've got blessed with such a great deal of uh, clay soil here in the Dallas County area, uh, we don't really want to want to garden in that soil anymore. We're going to make it a lot easier to garden by raising the bed and putting a good, good, good planting medium in our raised beds. The picture is actually my research is our research center that we just put in last year. And these are different size raised beds. This is the school garden model we're building that I'll take teachers through. So that summer in summer uh, recess, we will bring teachers in and teach them about how to build school gardens. And this is a model. And this is just taken the other day. This is the end of the season. 
uh, you can see the tomatoes are about finished at the top and different plants coming out of it. But uh, this is a two foot raised bed. And then the other, the other smaller raised beds are a foot. So we want to at least uh, go a foot deep. And I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, soil mix can be adjusted at times for if, if we're going to use that bed for a specific planting. And one thing about containing them, they're contained to a certain extent, but they don't have to necessarily be contained. We can raise a bed in the middle of our landscape. So I'm going to show you that. That's still considered a raised bed. We're still above the native soil. The importance is staying above the native soil, making a, me making a better plant in medium so we get a better nutrient exchange because some of our clay soils are very hard for the plants to pull nutrients out of. So if we, if we acidify that soil a little bit and moderate the, the pH in the soil a little bit, our plants will be healthier because they'll be able to pull soil. Also in the same light, Season the season of, of, of composting these beds over and over again in our planting will deepen your raised beds anyway, will deepen your planting beds anyway. So basically, even those those are just sitting on top two foot, after three or four seasons, that soil around it will be very deep and very, uh, very, very nutrient rich and will actually help exchange nutrients back into the into the into the system, too. So some of our vegetables that are foot deep, you plant a carrot, you carrot almost goes a foot deep on some of the big carrots. So. You'll adjust your sizes and your heights of your raised beds according to what you're going to grow. And you also do it for uh, all the school gardens have built. I've been doing school gardens for 30 years. And the school gardens we've put in have basically been, uh, we've always put at least one in for a chair so we could have chair access to it. So usually that's 30 to 34 inches high for a chair with a shelf. So if we've got some, some uh, students confined to chairs, they can pull up and garden also. So it's important to, to understand where you're going to put the beds and who's going to be servicing the beds. And, and that's also what we use in our senior centers. When we do our senior center beds, we're going to make them a little bit taller, a little bit higher. So there's not bending over. And we usually put a seat on that. So there could have been, you could have made this bed, you know, three foot tall, two and a half foot tall with a seat. So you can sit and garden. You don't have to stand over it. So it's very adaptable, very adjustable for what you want to use it for and who you want to use it for. So if I'm using it for, say, blueberry plants, and what I said, blueberry plants need very acidic soils, you can build a two-foot raised bed and do very well with blueberries here as long as you water and fertilize them correctly, whereas you couldn't just plant them in clay soil, they wouldn't work. Uh, the, big, the biggest environmental impact we have with our raised bed systems is we are not uh, fertilizing the pathways in this. We're, not, we're, we're very pinpointing where we're going to water, where we're going to fertilize, and if we have to use any kind of pest controls, where we're controlling the pests at. The bed right in front of you, that's a, that's a four by four, two foot tall, actually, actually has eggplant in it. The eggplant's finished up with production, but that's eggplant in it. And when I fertilize that, they're all in drip systems. I'll talk about irrigation here in a little bit. But what we fertilize, we only fertilize the six plants that are in that bed. We don't fertilize the pathways. You see around the pathways are mulch, heavy mulched areas, and I'll talk about that when we get to it but I don't fertilize that. We don't water that. We don't fertilize that. If we had any kind of issues, uh, we really try on all of our gardens to be organic in our issues with our pesticide issues. And there's, there's multiple products on the market uh, organically that you can treat if, if you do. I'm not doing that, but, uh, but these gardens, these gardens all in this research, they support homeless kitchens. They support a kitchen system that we're working with, uh, with a larger system in Dallas and the city and Helen's part of that larger system too, where we're trying to, we're trying to get food into into people's plates and on people's plates, into people's homes on their plates. And that's exactly where this goes. I've got major research in four or five different areas in this garden as far as plantings, fertilization, scheduling. And this is the front garden. We have a, we have a farm in the back. So this is only part of it. Uh, the bigger growing is in the back. And I'll show you. You'll see a picture of that here in a minute. But all this goes into kitchens. But, but I get to do research on it. We get to look at uh, best fertilization practices for raised beds and specifically with raised beds and tensions in mind. I've been using raised beds it's ancient. It's not new. It's not new technology. Uh, in Rome, ancient Rome had raised beds and grew figs in the middle in the middle of the cities as part of their landscaping. Uh, edible landscapes, all that's just rerun. It's nothing new. Nothing, we're not inventing anything new, really, in horticulture. What we're doing is rerunning some old practices and sometimes ancient practices, and 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 delivering them in our modern culture and our modern uh, in our modern societies, and they tend to work really, really well. So there's a win. The raised beds are just a winner and way to go. Uh, there's no, uh, there's not a lot of, uh, a lot of reasons not to use them, and it stops unnecessary tilling at the bottom. That's extraordinarily important to quit tilling, to sequester carbon, to quit losing carbon. Every time we till into the soil, we we put carbon in the atmosphere, and we lose that carbon. But when you till, also you destroy the soil uh, systems, the soil uh, food systems, the food netting, which are microbes. Microbes 
earthworms, everything that lives subsoil that actually feeds the soil and makes a living environment, you destroy it and it has to start over again in that area. So this way we're just feeding on top of it. We're not destroying the systems and we're building soil in the beds and building soil in our environment just the way Mother Nature does. Mother Nature doesn't till and Mother Nature also doesn't build soil from the bottom up. She doesn't till it up. She builds from the top down. Leaves, sticks, dead animals, animal poop, everything is what builds soils in nature systems. And this is exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to build the soil from the top down. So that's a big advantage. There's no there's no wrong way with raised beds. If you build them right, and I'm going to walk run you through a little bit of that, it's just a way to go in the garden. We can drop them anywhere, and we can as long as you got sunshine, you can garden. Next one, please. Uh, they can, the borders can be made of different things, uh, all different kinds of materials. I've got some kits I'll show you here in a minute. What we use in our display gardens are uh, usually cedar. I use cedar themselves. I will stain the cedar to even give it more life. And I've gotten sometimes 12 to 15 years out of some of the cedar. It doesn't break down. You can use pine untreated. It won't give you very long. It will give you a few years. Uh, as of right now, tests are showing that we can use the, the new treated lumbers are okay to use in these applications. We haven't got the research back. Uh, they changed in 2003. They changed from the arsenic coatings on the, on the, uh, on the treated lumber, the pressure treated lumber you get at the centers. And they went to a, a copper salt solution type that's even that's less uh, – will not leach as much into the soils and got the arsenic out of it, got the, got the carcinogen out of it basically because that's what it was. But right now, for the research we've had, research we're doing, it's still in action across the country, not just, not just A&M, but we also use Penn State and all of our other extension, uh, uh, extension uh, universities. Right now, it's still safe to use. If it doesn't, if something happens and research says it isn't, it'll be pulled off the board and we will certainly not do it anymore. But it'll give you six, seven years of treated wood. So it'll give you in between and, and you've got different options there for wood. To me, stone is a perfect alternative for a raised bed. If you could do stone, big boulders or some kind of stone or some kind of brick. Uh, the uh, the new the blocks that you get at the home centers, the uh, cement blocks used to be... Uh, called cinder blocks where there's not cinder in them anymore. So they're absolutely safe and make a great border. They're of course long lasting uh, with adequate care. They're not going to fall apart. They will make a great bed for you. And you've got options in this plastic, good containers. I mean, uh, plastic uh, fabrications now are, are being built and made for this. You know, your new decking boards that are made out of resins, those work also. So there's lots of different options in this. Uh, you can, they're very doubt. They're very, very optional on where you want to put them. You got lots of options. You can put them as we're doing at the bottom picture to the left. That's, that's uh, Mark Twain Elementary School. That's us building garden. That's probably 10 years ago, putting some gardens. I'm, I'm gar doing this with third graders. We're putting them on the actual grounds uh, and we're starting to build there up at the top. That's actually one of mine at home. To the right is the research center. The beds you just saw uh, on the first slide with the with the eggplant, that's them being built. That's the beds being built by the master gardener team, and we put those on. Uh, we put those on soil. You see, those are just on. We don't didn't have to till, and or didn't, we don't till, but didn't have to kill the weeds or anything. I'll talk about that when we get to it. But that's building in process. Uh, they can be as long as you want them. These containers, these contained borders and contained beds. Uh, you just don't want to make them any wider than four foot. You want to be able to work across it and you don't want to ever step into it. A big, huge advantage is the fact that build it four foot square. You can you can actually never step in this bed. Uh, the maintenance on these beds, basically, we're going to and I'll talk about building these beds, but we put a good soil in there and then we'll be every year. We'll just compost them through each rotation. These go through two planting rotations for vegetables. So we'll go through the rotations and vegetable plantings. And we'll put compost on top. That's basically it until I get into fertilizations of the tomatoes, but very light. And it's just not it's, it's very compatible with the environment. I've always tried to say I've always tried to do whatever we can and, and try to and we do. We just try to try to work with the environment, work with natural processes. And I use a lot of permacultural practices mixed in with with root research and everything we do is research. So this comes from study, not from, uh, you know, just us wanting to do it this way. This is how it works, working with nature, not against her. So uh, it, it does really work. And we grow a lot of food out of this. But uh the uh, no wider than four could be as long as you want them. We're eight to 12 foot. But if you're doing anything longer than four uh, and you're doing an eight foot, you'll want to put center post in the middle. You'll see that bottom picture with the school when we're doing the school. You'll see that in this on the picture next to it, you'll see three posts, three actual foot posts, footings. 
those three footings. You'll want three of those if you're eight foot. A four by four, you don't have to necessarily use that, but if you've got, if you're eight foot plus, uh, what'll happen is you'll get a Boeing in there, and those actually are four inches into the ground. So that footing is actually in the ground four inches. It's not cemented, it's not concreted in, it's just in the ground, and as it settles, it will not move anywhere. Uh, you know, I've, I've been doing that ever since I've been in the school gardens, but it also gives a good brace for the uh, for the wood to stay, and the wood won't bow, it won't bend out. You don't have a lot of pressure with soils, but you will have some, and especially if you're using treated lumber, treated lumber generally comes out wet. And as, as you set it out and as it's there, as it dries up, it tends to bow a little bit as it dries and it shrinks. So it's so go ahead and put that middle that middle footing on there and put them every four foot. So if I've got a 16 footer, I want four of those footings. I want to make sure I don't get a lot of bud. I want this to last for a long, long time. So I want to make sure it, all, it gives it make sure this is going to last a while. But it also gives you a good solid uh, board, a good solid footing to screw your boards into. Uh, use hey, your Jeff? irrigation. Yes, yes. Jeff, we got a couple of questions. Okay, I'm All ready. Right. And, and so we have one in particular. Uh, how about using leftover pre-stained wood for your borders? Uh, leftover pre-stained wood can do well, can do okay, depending on what the stain was and how old the stain was. It depend, is it an oil-based or is it a water-based stain? You'll see the bed to the right. We don't stain down at the soil level. We only st we stain the outsides, which won't be, but inside of that, you see it's only stained to that level, and that's where the soil level will be. Would that hurt it? No, that's an oil base, but it's a linseed oil base. It's not a, it's not a, I just don't usually do it just for practice. Uh, you'd have to know what the oil is and how old the oil is. Some older oils might tend to have some different kinds of, of, uh, of petrochemical in it, which we wouldn't want it be in there. But if it's something recently used, you should be okay with that. And I think you'd be all right with that. Definitely you can scrape, you can absolutely scavenge things to make this with. Old fencing, all kinds of things you can find and make these raised beds with, and they, they will absolutely work. All right, I got one more question, Jeff. So you okay. talked about adding that brace on uh, every four foot. Why is mm -hmm. the brace on the inside of the bed and not on the outside of the bed? It could be the one, but because if you walk around the beds, you tend to kids would tend to trip on them, and I will like them on the inside. You could put them on the outside if you wanted to. If it's just your home garden, you could put them either way, either direction. Uh, <laughs> I put low tunnels into there and I'll show you here. I'll show you, I'll show you why here in a second. Once we get to that part of this presentation and what I do with the, with the actual footings too, but you could put them on the outside. A lot of, a lot of them are on the outside. Uh, just my preference because I had kids running around beds usually in the schools and uh, we had mowers. Those beds sometimes were in the yard. You sit Mark Twain down there. We didn't have the, the chance to put mulch around the bed. So they were just out in the yard. So we'd have people mow around them and, they got a cleaner mow and cleaner weed eat around it if we put them on the inside. Okay. But we use drip irrigation. I'll, I'll talk about irrigating here in a minute. And uh, very, very uh, easy to control. And if we, if we add tunnels to this, if we add low tunnels to it, which is just a plastic coverings, then we can extend our growing season. We actually plant the farm, and I'll show you that in a second. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Actually, we'll actually plant the first tomatoes in January, the beginning of January, to put under the raised. Oh, well, this is bed material. Let me go to this, and I'll go to that. Uh, raised bed mixes. There's lots of raised bed, raised bed mixes on the market today. Uh, this, is a, this is a little different than your potting mixes, because potting mixes are, are sterile and don't have a soil base in it. Wouldn't have sandy in it. Wouldn't have a loam soil. Uh, you'll need some binding of some sand in it, some kind of soil in there, and, and basically – your top soils that are clean and organic are clean and uh, not not clay based, but loamy, lo sandy loam based will not have any kind of uh, abstract chemical in it. It's going to be straight and clean. Organic compost, finished compost. My beds at home are this 50 50 mix of this, and it's just a layering process. I'll layer that right hand bag on the bottom about six inches, uh, depending on how big the bed. If it's a foot bed, it'll be three inches. Three inches of soil, three inches of compost, three inches of soil. Then I'll top it with just a little bit more compost. But it's not a, it's not a fact. It's not a factual science. This is just half and half. If you can get 50 percent of one and 50 percent of the other in a 12 inch bed, high bed, you're fine. And this will make a very, very good bed over future. Uh, uh, raised bed mixes generally will have more organic in it uh, with some more organic additions to it could have some. Uh, Sometimes some fertilizers in it, some different things. It'd be organic fertilizer, but sometimes it'd be some fertilizer. Sometimes some manures in it, things like that in your raised bed mixes. I don't typically use manure in the beds. I typically will use manure in compost, but I don't want manure directly in the beds if I've got fresh manure. So don't ever do that. 
just compost it in a composting system and then put it in there. But uh, you, what you can't use in this, and this is extremely important, you can't dig up your garden soil and put it in this. Your garden soil is what we're trying to stay away from. And your garden soil, if you put your garden clay soil into this, into a raised bed, you would just eventually have just a big raised block of cement. That would, that would be so dried out in that raised bed, it would just cement out, and you wouldn't have the drainage. You wouldn't have the nutrient exchange you need for pH, uh, the pH management. So basically, you can't use garden soil. You're going to have to use a mixed soil into this, but not potting soil. Potting soil belongs in pots. This is a raised bed mix. So you want a raised bed mix, or you want to go ahead and mix your own. Half compost, half loamy top soil is perfectly fine. Uh, you can get it bulk. You can get it from uh, your garden centers. You can buy bulk from soil companies that do multiple raised bed mixes now and can dump it in your driveway. And you can load up your raised beds. Or you can do it. You can go ahead to your to your home improvement stores and buy it from your home improvement stores. You can add, you can add if you do this 50-50 of topsoil and organic at home, which is easy to do because you buy it in the bags and you just you lay it out and you lay it into the to the beds and kind of just I don't mix it up. I just lay it in layers. Again, I'm working from top down, so. And it doesn't matter particularly how it is, but there's some really good soils. Uh, it, it's, it's very, le yeah, absolutely less expensive than the other. This is a cheaper way to go, but it's a very adequate way to go. And cheaper is not in bad. Cheaper isn't good on this this particular application. I want you to get the best product or best best materials you can, but this is this works perfectly well from a from a a, a soil mix, a typical raised bed mix. Because when they put raised bed on the bag, they raise it three or four dollars a bag. So you're going to pay for the name on there, but they do add other amendments to it. But you're going to pay for it, but you can add amendments to this. Worm castings are a great amendment to the topsoil organic compost uh, mix. Some, some you can buy castings and you can buy, add the castings to it. Coffee grounds, used coffee grounds are excellent for this, excellent binding material for this, uh, excellent nutrient uh, amend, amendment to this. Uh, and you compost at home, you compost systems at home. But once this bed is established, once your raised beds are established, and you've grown them through that first season, you're going into your next season, you don't really want to till into that anymore. You don't have to fork it in. You just add compost on top. If you've mixed it properly, that's going to be very luvial, very tilthy soil. It's going to be well-drained. It's going to be soft to get into. Our, our, our goal is to have that raised bed. If I've got a two-foot raised bed, I can wiggle my hand all the way down to the bottom. That's the goal to get this bed. That's how tilthy you want this bed to be. I, I don't want it to be mulched and soft. I want it to be where you got to wiggle through it and then you got to get through the top you got to get through some soil in there to get to the bottom but that's what we want to get to because we want that bed to be very very we want the drainage and we want the alluvial properties of being very tilty very soft and fluffy so that's what you'll get out of this and these things will help add to it and help quicken it so amendments are perfectly fine uh, there, there's other things on the market green sands things like that which are minerals which mineral additions never particularly hurt but mineral additions would be in the coffee and with mineral additions the minerals would be in if you're doing a vegetable and you're doing fertilizations and for vegetable gardens, which you'll have to do for maximizing vegetables. Uh, your your good organic mixes are your good synthetic mixes, and I'm not I, I don't we use organics, and I'm an organic gardener for the most for, for the most part of everything, and I teach organics, but I also teach synthetics. If you want to use synthetics, that's absolutely fine. You just got to use it properly, and you just got to be responsible for you for the way you're using this, and make sure that that does not get into our systems. We do not want any kind of fertilizer whatsoever. It's as bad to get organic nitrogen in the water system as this synthetic nitrogen is coming in from petroleum. So one's not better than the other ones. All of them are all of them are bad. So we don't want them leaching in. And I'm going to show you some things to stop that when we get to them as we go through it. But um, worm castings. Uh, if you're doing hookah culture, which I'll show you here in a minute, you can add logs to the bottom. Let's keep going, and I'll show you that in a second because I've got a picture of that. So that'll help to to raise some stuff. This is a typical raised bed in the layering system. When I've talked about layering compost and topsoils, these are 18 inches. That's a, those are two by eights. This is what this is my one of mine at home. This is a layering system where it's basically compost, topsoil, compost to be on top, uh, you know, and then I'll layer that up to the top of it. And you'll see also have the painted the stained areas where it's not stained to the top. It, it again, it's it, it's just not necessary, and I just don't do it. I've never done it, and I've always just it's better to be safe to make sure, but the stain I use is a good stain, and it's 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 not a uh, a leachable stain with anything in it. It's got a good lint oil in it, so it's a good stain. But okay, let's go to the next one. Okay. So Jeff, while we're waiting for that transition, um, <clears throat> what do you do to the bottom of your beds? Like, do you put cardboard down, or how do you keep the grass? Absolutely, out? absolutely. You're gonna put cardboard. I'm gonna show you that it's coming up. So 
That'll come up next. Absolutely, you'll cardboard the bottom. We will cardboard the bottom and the cardboard all around it. This is that bed you just saw being filled. And let me talk about a raised bed in, in an area. If I'm building, this is a vegetable garden. This is actually blueberries and, and blackberries. This is part of the one of my gardens. And this is the around all of my gardens, excluding landscaped gardens, you'll see the mulch, you'll see the mulch around it. And I always mulch around there for multiple different reasons. One reason is insect control. A lot of the insects that get into our garden beds or get into our vegetables overwinter in the grasses or actually feed into the grasses and will come to the beds. This eliminates that by keeping a nice mulch layer around it. Uh, it kills weeds, weed suppression, because vegetables can't live with weeds. Nothing can live with weeds. So we have no weeds in the beds. And you'll see all these beds you're going to be seeing. You're not going to see any weeds in all of them because we suppress it through our planting. So important to use best practice planting when you're putting a garden bed in raised bed or in bed gardens or sheet mulching, which I'll talk about. You want to make sure that you have a nice garden plan. And part of that plan needs to be, how can I suppress weeds and also water capture? What I've built here around these beds and what we build around our raised beds is just a huge sponge. Anything leaching from that garden bed is going to be captured within that big sponge, that big wooden sponge we've just put around it. Uh, in the middle of this one is actually a, a uh, is actually a plum tree. And that's that, that's a fruiting tree in the middle, and these are down. That's a plum there, and he's over the top of them, and then underneath them uh, are blackberries and some blueberries. So it kind of just – then this allows me to grow blueberries at home, which I normally couldn't do because I need very acidic soil. The back bed, a part of this U, the part of the U with the little blueberry sticks, you can barely see those, that's got peat moss and acidics in it. That's more acidic than the other two. The other two are basically for blackberries. See, I can control my nutrients, and I can control exactly what kind of bed I want to build in this. So in between the U – the back of the U is acidic. The two are neutral. The two others are acidic to neutral, but the back is very acidic. I've added more peat moss and I can control fertilizations. The water is going to be the same. So you see the little white pipes, that's the plumb for drip irrigation. So it's plumbed in and you'll put the drip irrigation grids, but you put the plumbing in before you build it, before you do that. And you'll, I'll show you some of that. I've got pictures of that as we go. So this is a way to really control what you want to do. But again, this is part of a best practice plan. When I build a raised bed, I'll have a specific reason for building these raised beds. Am I going to grow vegetables on it? If I grow vegetables in it, even though I do multiple rotations of vegetables, it, it's going to go from tomatoes to maybe greens to collards or something. It's going to be the same soil requirements for all that group of vegetables. But if I want to grow berries, sometimes berry requirements are a little different. I will change that. And it'll stay berries for good. I don't rotate the blueberries out. The blueberries are a permanent bush. They're, they're bush, so they'll stay in it. So you can grow bushes. You can grow vegetable plants. You can certainly grow flowers in them, whatever you want to grow. But it's so it's, you get such multiple use out of this. And this is looking across to the other beds, part of the other bed. That's the chicken coops there. You're looking across to the chicken coops, which is also that's sheet mulched. All that is a sheet mulch. All my beds are sheet mulched. I'll show you that here in a minute. That's cardboard on the bottom, layering system to build the beds. Again, I don't till. I don't dig in when I do this. And everything grows wonderfully that way. And this is the way we can protect our environment. This is the way we can control carbon, uh, the carbon releases, and we can sequester our carbon, keeping it into the soil. Soil needs the carbon. The plants need the carbon desperately, and we just we got to quit eliminating it and, and quit uh, using it, wasting it up in the sea, in the air. It will fall in and come back into the, over a season or two. But basically, we're we're polluting ourselves if we keep doing this. So we've got to stop doing that. Next one. That's, that's the layering process, so this is, I don't know where to put it in. Uh, raised beds can go to, this is square foot gardening. I'm very quick, I'm not gonna go into this very much. There's a square foot gardening menu on there uh, that you can go to in different ways to plant your beds if you're not comfortable planting. This was good for school kids because we could teach them math. Uh, we could teach arithmetic, we could teach grafting or, or charting, we could teach graphs, all kinds of things in this. You have to take this with a grain of salt though. When you look at that and you see that little square foot, and if, you, if you're looking at a square foot chart that tells you one square foot, one tomato plant for one square foot, that ain't going to work because a tomato plant gets four or five foot wide. You've got to just take it. you got to take this with a grain of salt. It, it was it was invented in the 70s or really kind of designed in the 70s to be uh, marketed uh, to really give you a good planting, uh, a planting layout. For the most part, it works very, very well. 16 carats to a 16 carats to a square foot. Things like that work very well. But some of the bigger plantings because we control the way we control the sizing with cages and because we've got an intermediate or indeterminate tomato, that sucker is going to get four or five foot tall and four foot wide. It, you got to take that. And you got to understand how many squares it's going to actually take, but don't throw this out the window. This is a good product. This is a good method if you want to learn how to do this, but this is just, it, it lends itself very well to a confined square foot bed. 
because you got a rectangular bed works extremely well. It's eight foot by four foot. That works perfectly. Thirty two square foot. So you can measure out and that way you can tell planning and then you get used to planning on their own. So this is a great way for a garden for beginning gardeners to start out their gardens, and their planting plans. OK, next. These are just some options, uh, kits you can buy. Uh, corrugated, you see the cement block on the left-hand bottom. You'll see the wood kits, plastic uh, resin kits, corrugated uh, water troughs. You can take, you can go and buy the old water troughs, uh, the tin troughs, and you can actually cut the bottoms out of them, use as a raised bed. You cut the, you, you just make a lot of holes in them and it'll just be a, a container garden, a container bed. But if you want a true raised bed, raised bed, you'll put it on the, uh, You'll actually lay it, cut the bottom out of it. But you see most of these, for the most part, are sent on mulch. These aren't mine. These are ones I pulled that I wanted to show you that most of the time. And the one even on the cement blocks. You cement blocks are turned up. The way they're turned up, uh, you'll plant the vegetable garden inside. And around all the little holes, you'll put in small pollinator flowers, something there to add some pollination, uh, some pollinators, bring some pollinators back into the garden. So the little planting holes are useful also. You can grow a couple of carrots in each one of those holes also if you want an eight-inch carrot. So there's some varieties of carrots that are called Danvers shorts and different types that only get six to eight inches but get really wide. A carrot or two will grow wonderfully in those little planting areas. You'll mix. You'll use the same kind of soil you use in your bed and stick it into your uh, into your planting holes. Be sure and plant those if you're using those because they work very, very well. Uh, the specialty beds, like I talked, we can use them specially plant types, but also that middle bed is a potato bed, the one on the bottom. That's a specialty bed that that's how you plant potatoes. That's your first set of seed potatoes. And as they grow up, you're going to add, as they grow up and green, you're going to add soil to them and you're going to put another layer. You're going to grow them all the way to the top. And as you start to harvest them, you'll just harvest that top layer down. Potatoes grow above where the seed is planted. And seed potato is a potato that hasn't been sprayed with any kind of chemical to, to deter growth. Any potato can grow baby potatoes. The ones you buy in the store that you eat, uh, those are the same, but they've been sprayed and they've been they've been chemically uh, coated so they don't sprout and they won't sprout for a while. Once that coating wears off, once you get them in a, in a, in a dark location, which would be under soil, basically, if you plant them in the garden, they will sprout eventually. But you want seed potatoes, buy potatoes that, is, that haven't been coated and haven't been stopped growth process. But as you harvest, you'll just take one layer off at a time as you're going down the hill. So you'll grow up the hill and you'll harvest down the hill. So at the end, you'll be back down to that bottom. Sweet potato is a different story. This is a sweet potato. This is an Irish potato, a white potato. Sweet potatoes, you know, they grow underneath them. They'll grow from the top down, whereas a, whereas a white Irish potato grows above where you planted it. So you can see how deep you can get that bed. And they used to do tires this way, old tires and stuff. Good Lord, that was horrible. I can't imagine what chemicals are in those tires. So use wood. Build your box. Make your box if you love potatoes. So just very, very many options, lots of options, lots of ways to go with raised beds. Okay, next. This is the low tunnel systems that you can add to raised beds. And this is the farm. This is our growing farm in the back of that property that I was talking about. What this does is allows us to in the season. So what you see here is you see early season where this is actually probably January, February, where we're actually got the plastic going on it. We will actually put the, we'll put the tomatoes and peppers in gen, middle of January to grow them under tunnels, keeps the heat up, keeps the seedlings growing. And by the time, by the time that says on the charts, usually the end of March, 1st of April, to plant uh, tomatoes on charts around this area, we will be harvesting tomatoes by that time. We'll start our first harvest generally in March, into March. So we'll harvest while everybody else. This extended planting season, this extends the planting season for summer into fall because we've got them basically under the house. But on spring, let me just take you through spring. In spring, they were planted January the 11th, started harvesting generally around the end of March, 1st of April. We're harvesting some of the first reds coming off, the first blush tomatoes coming off. Once before that, way before that, once we get past frost and freezes, we pull the plastic off and we put bird netting on it. So it's netted with bird netting. And that way we've got our birds already before we get the tomatoes to the top. Because once the tomatoes are grown, they're up over that plastic hoops. Uh, in the hoops themselves, have, we also put cages in for the tomatoes, so we tie the cages to the hoops. We have a very, very standard, very, very sturdy structure anyway, the way we build them. But this just extends a growing season. Now, you can do this on your home garden, a four by eight PVC, uh, six, six, uh, six millimeter plastic, UV protected plastics. You can buy them on any Amazon, anywhere you can get these. They're, they're very inexpensive. 
but they extend your growing seasons if you want an extended season. And it gives you lots of options. And because come come uh, you know come springtime when you're starting to harvest tomatoes, the worst thing you do is you watch and watch and watch, and you're all excited, and you go out there, and the birds beat you to it. And the birds already pecked your tomato, which they will do. They're watching them too, just like you are. And they want them when they're when they turn red. Red's a signal color to invite the birds in, so they'll start getting a uh, so they'll start biting the tomatoes, spread the seeds. Plants do that on purpose. That's not accidental. So they're triggering when that seed is viable to be passed through a system to be able to, to reproduce. But uh, this eliminates. You put your bird netting over the over that. You, we put the plastic in the barn. We're about to bring the plastic back out again. Uh, within the next three weeks, we'll have the plastic back on. We'll get ready to plant. In January again, we'll do the same thing and cycle through it. So it's a it's a great way to extend the season. You'll see it all the way through there. And this is easy, so easy to do with the beds. Look up low tunnel systems. A high tunnel system would be something that's larger that you walk into, and you can actually grow under and you walk into it. As a, it's not a greenhouse because these are not heated. These are not heated and they're not not uh, cooled or they don't have any systems like that. But they're just a, a, a plastic covering that basically extends the seasons. Great to mix with the raised bed though. A good way to go. We can we can produce a lot of food out of this. This little garden right here's already produced over two tons of food in the first season we put it in. So it's amazing production for the footprint is only one twenty fifth of an acre with the raised bed systems. Now my these are bar part and we haven't got mulch down yet, but we will put mulch down around it and we are going to uh we are going to uh this is a teaching garden. I have to teach large classes out of this when they come in. So basically I've spread them out further than you need to be. You could put them closer together, but I also have 12 acres back there to use. And you'll see the, uh, just a, just a great way to go add tunnels to it. You got a so question? Jeff, here? Yes, we do. So Jeff, what kind of plastic do you recommend we use? And then how do you store this when you're not using it? Well, the UV, this plastic is, uh, it's six millimeter. UV protected greenhouse plastic. It's on the market as a specific plastic. UV protected, so that so it's not just UV. It keeps it a little bit cooler underneath, but it's specifically for it. You don't want to use just anything. And this six millimeter will give us the thickness of this plastic will give us at least three seasons without it tearing. After three seasons, it will start breaking down eventually as its UV protection uh, lessens. But I, I mean, these were this is a hundred foot. This is a hundred foot long. So these are one piece of plastic. And the 100 foot by 12 was like $112 or $114. But you go and you can find these at Amazon, uh, the home centers, nurseries. Basically, you'd use a, you know, a 10 by 5 or 10 by 6 on what you, however wide your bed's going to be, or 10 by 8 maybe. That could be as little as $20, $25. But it's UV protected and it's at least 6 millimeter. It needs to, it needs to be thick enough to where it can blow in the wind. Be battered around a little bit, and not tear, but it, but you need that UV protection for this, and you got to get them off in time. You only leave them on until it starts getting warm. We'll pull this as long once we're past those freezes. Once we get past the freezes, the plants are already a foot, foot and a half tall. They're inside the beds and they're growing real well under this plastic. Once we pull the plastic, we'll just we take it, we roll it off onto a big spindle, and we put them in the barn back there in the back. We'll store them in the barn, and we'll just unroll it again and put it back out. You'll see two with them on. You'll see the two to the right-hand side that's not on it that we've already pulled off to the side. Those are actually green beds this year, so we didn't put them over the greens. We only put them over fruit, uh, so it's only over the fruit, but you'll see those are, those are planted in greens. On the green beds, I'll show you what we do to those. Does the plastic need to be to the ground? I see that one from somebody. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's to the ground because it's easier for us to break down and hold down in heavy winds, especially as long as this piece is. It needs to be to the ground. It needs to be past the bed level because you can't let any wind get into it. The only thing openings we have in this is the ends. We keep the ends open. And if we're in December and, or January, and you know in January we can get 60, 80 degree days. If it gets too warm in January, we will pull it. Uh, we will pull half of it back up. We got to adjust it. You got to adjust it to the weather because we're not, we, we don't have a, a great specific weather here that are great. January can be in the 70s and 80s at times, and, and we don't have that where they have up north where they're more consistent in, in the medium temperatures. So you got to adjust it back and forth. Uh, we clamp them down. I saw that. We clamp them down there. Actually, if you'll go to the right of this picture, if I can get the cursor to the right, go up a little bit, right on that first line, down to the first, down to the bed itself, right below, go down just a little bit, right over just to the left. I, I don't have the cursor, so we're doing this to the left. Right there, you'll just, right there, 
that is a clamp. You can buy clamps that clamp onto it. It's hard to see, I know, but there are PVC greenhouse clamps that are made out of PVC, specifically designed to clamp them. We clamp across the ridge, and on the bottom, one side, we've got, it, we've got a board securing, and the other side, we have bricks along the bottom to secure it. And that way we just lay bricks on it. That way we can pull it up and out. But there are clamps. That is a clamp there. And there's clamps all over it. They're just a little hard to see. Very hard on this one, I know. But that's the way we secure them. And they stay secured on that. Smaller bed, you could probably break them down or rock them down or something and be okay. This, once wind gets under, just like a big parachute. I mean, it could rip it all. It could, it could go off pretty quickly. So we secure it pretty, pretty hardly with that. So. All right, next one. We'll start going through these a little quicker. Okay, these are just low tunnel systems. One to the right hand, to the left hand side, that is netting for insect netting. So that 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 uh, will allow us not to have to spray so much insecticides on our our cabbage lopers or different things. As soon as you put your seed in the ground for your vegetables, for your green vegetables, and that's all your green vegetables, cabbage, lettuce, uh, broccoli, whatever you're putting in. As soon as you plant it, you put this netting. This is a very very fine netting that that. Uh, We'll keep some of the smaller insects out. doesn't keep them all out, but we'll keep some of them out in the summer. It does help. And then winter protection, that's, that's the application on a bed. Basically, if it's an in-ground bed, that's your application you'd be using at home. You can secure it any way you want to secure them. You can, we secure the bottoms of that. See the brick around them? This is not mine, but this is the one that, that I picked out because of the secure. Also, as the, where the PVC comes down, if you wanted to drive a rebar, and just, just put it over the top of a rebar. You could put it in that right there. You could put it over the top of a rebar. Or you can use the conduit clamps, the, the metal conduit that you run electric to. There's half-inch clamps that you can buy that are really cheap, 25 for a couple of bucks, and screw the clamps into it. But do Google this. Do, do look at this. I don't always like Dr. Google, but on this one, there's lots of good practical knowledge for this to build a low tunnel system. So, all right, let's go next. Okay, now the next time, this is sheet mulching. This is a raised bed also. This is not a contained raised bed. This is a little different. This is the front gardens, how we built the garden. The first picture of the research center with the, uh, with the uh, eggplant and all that up front, this is part of those garden systems. And you'll see the cardboard laid. Somebody asked about cardboard. We put cardboard on that whole front yard. Uh, took us about 20 truckloads of cardboard, but took it to the whole front yard, and then we started our sheet mulching. Sheet mulching is just another way to raise your bedding profile, and it also builds just like you're building, or if, if that was bordered, same thing inside. You'll use either a good mix, or you use that same 50-50 compost and topsoil works wonderfully here on top of this. As it breaks down, as it ages and matures, it will break down into the clay soils even and help loosen up the clay soils and as the plants dig through and as insects dig under, it'll build soil systems. So this is a, there's lots of method, there's lots of different formulas for sheet mulching, just tons of different ways to do it. Uh, this is, I, I want the cheapest, easiest, and that works most practical. Some people use straws and haze and all that. The problem with straw, the problem with straw and hay right now is the fact that, uh, unless, you, unless you really know where it's coming from, okay, I need to go back one more. Unless you really know where it's coming from, uh, they care, it will carry residual herbicides in it that they're using for their hay fields. And sometimes I've had, there is now a syndrome in uh, vegetable gardens and raised bed vegetable gardens, which is a, a residual syndrome of insecticides where people that use straw and hay as, as, a, as a compost and that, that herbicide did not uh, leach out, it won't leach out necessarily if it's embedded in the hay. And it will leach into the system. So I don't like haze. I don't like, not, not unless you know where it's coming from. Uh, farmers used it, and it's been used for, for millennia because that was what was there. They used the straw, basically, for the breakdown. The hay was fed. But basically, this day and, you know, kind of in this day and age, we don't want to don't want to, uh, to use it if we don't have to use it. There's other ways to go. Bag compost or mixed compost that you're making at home with topsoil, loamy topsoil works wonderfully well. This was bought. Uh, you can see the big pile. You can see us putting it in together. These were, we built seven big beds out of this, and that was just – that's a bulk mix from a local soil company that's a raised bed. That's, a, that's actually a rose mix, which is a good compost, the sandy loam, and that's how we build the soils. And after four, five, six seasons, they will make a planted bed. I'm going to show you mine, and I'm, I'll show you mine after eight years and what they look like when you do this. This is exactly how I built my beds at home. I've been doing this for – 30 years now, 25, 30 years. This is not new either. Uh, I've never till I haven't, I've been against tilling since I was, you know, in holy culture as a young guy. And uh, this is just a, a good way to build them. Use the layering methods. And we go to the next slide. I'll give you just a rough idea how we build a bed without 
the, 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 uh, this is how we build a bed with just using compost and bark. And actually this is from Home Depot or Lowe's. This is your, your basic, uh, home center works wonderfully well. This is how I built all my beds. I'm going to show you the ones that result of this, but cardboard down first, six inches of finished mulch over the bottom. You all are finished compost. I'm sorry, over the bottom. You always want to start the bottom layer with compost. Compost is finished and hot and it will help break the cardboard down quicker. And as the cardboard starts to soften, it will bring the earthworms up. Earthworms love cardboard. They love paper. It will bring them up and it will help them to, uh, to start breaking it down even faster. The second layer is shredded mulch. I generally don't put mulch anywhere under soil except for this particular application because as that compost is breaking down, I need some feed for the new microbes that are being built. A lot of microbes, microbes kind of live in your soul as a family, different families or different groupings. They're in a taste, in a tablespoon, there could be a billion types of microbes or a billion microbes in a tablespoon of soil, but they're different groups break down wood at different times. So the bigger the wood chips has a certain group of microbes that break that down. As it breaks into compost, it's got another group that breaks it down. And if I, if I, and, and if at this point in the application, I mix some mulch in there, some shredded bark mulch, which is, I like pine bark. Pine bark is soft and will break down pretty quickly. If I mix different sizes of, of finished of, of, uh, organic bark materials or different organic breakdown materials, then I could bring bigger families into it. Uh, six inches, six inches, got me a foot tall. Then I will add my actual six inch layer of clean loamy topsoil. Again, this is bought at a home center. This isn't magic. This isn't anywhere special. This was at a home center. This is where I did all my beds at home. This is where this is where I did all my beds. This is where I've been building beds for a long, long time for myself. But six inches of a clean loamy soil, which is that you see the soil to the right hand side to the, the third picture. But you can see how the soil is uh, that picture slid. You can see that top soil has loamy. It's sandy looking. It's got sand in it. Uh, Six inches of that, I've got 18 inches, and I'm going to finish on top of compost and fix six inches. What you're going to end up with, if you see the bottom picture, just about 24 inches deep on the bed, and let, I'll let it sit. This, this, is, this is the time to do this now. Build your, build your sheet mulch beds now. Build your lasagna garden now, which is the same thing. Build them now. Let them sit over winter, plant in spring because they'll break down. The soil will shift. They'll seek their levels. You don't have to mix this in together. I don't ever mix them. Just let it shift and let it build. Let it let it seek its level. The, the top soil will actually permeate throughout the bolts, the, the actual mulch bed, and will actually be as a binder to the bed. Hold it together. Make it stick together so it won't blow away. It won't be loose. And it'll, it'll seek its own level. Soil always does. Soil does not need our help to be built. Soil will be built if it's got the proper materials. And it will build itself, but always start with it. I do not leave the blocks in on that first picture. They're just holding the cardboard down. It was a windy day, but that just shows the materials I use. You don't have to use that. I don't, I don't hawk a brand or I don't care what brand you use, but you see the organic compost is 100% organic. Pine bar mulch is a clean pine bar and the top soil is loamy. That's what I want to use in them. And you can use any brand you want to use. So that's the seat mulch. Look this up again. You can Google this, but be very careful about Googling this because people – People that want to put just manures in this, that's, that's, that's absolutely not what we want. What manures are doing the soil, fresh manure will do in the soil, it's going to lead to all kinds of, uh, you're going to lead to all kinds of different, and this is where we get listerias, and this is where we get salmonellas in our greens and such. You don't put raw manures into your garden. You don't put raw manures in it. You put raw manures in your compost and let it be part of your composting system. The only thing you put in the garden, there's only one manure, and that's llama manure. Is, it doesn't carry the gut, by, the gut bacteria that the other manures carry. But how many of you got llamas? If you had llamas, you could do it. But still, then put it in the compost and build your compost in there. Don't put raw manures in there. So that never works. But this is it. I know this is, we're going to go through this quickly because we've got to get rolling. But uh, that's sheet mulching. That's a great way to go. If I'm building beds. So if we go to the next one. All right, Jeff. So we got a couple questions. So okay. you mentioned about layering cardboard, uh, you know, at the bottom. How many layers of cardboard do you recommend? Two packing boxes thick, if you can. You know, a packing box. You see the thickness of a packing box. Mm -hmm. If I layers of that thickness, that's all I need, basically. You, they they also say you can use newspapers, but you'd have to use so many newspapers, it's not worth the effort. It's not. It, it, I mean, you could use them if you got them. But people don't have newspapers anymore. Basically, you know, they don't have paper materials. And if I'm using a paper material. I've got to make sure say, some kind of printed material. I've got to make sure that when I lick my thumb and I rub it across it, that that material, that, that printing comes off of it. I want that printing to smear. That means it's a soy-based print. If it doesn't come off, it's typically it's a chemical-based print. 
which they used to do. Now they're all soy. Everybody's going to soy or natural materials. So it breaks down better into our composting systems. But basically, but know that. But cardboard just works great. Uh, the thickness of, of a good corrugated cardboard, you don't want that cardboard to have any kind of plastic coating on it. You want to take off all the tape because that won't break down. And you really want to try to get the, uh, the staples out of it if you can. Now, staples will break down, but try to pull it. You want it to be clean. So you want to pull out everything. You can absolutely be used cardboard. This is the best way to recycle cardboard there is. And this is my landscape, but one of my landscapes at home. This is part of the gardens at home. This was all sheet mulch. Every one of this, every bit of this was sheet mulch. That exact same mixture I just showed you. This is only three seasons end of that. And that's uh, the, all my gardens are food gardens mixed in. So there's a peach tree. There's also, uh, you'll see landscape plants, pollinators. The whole, the whole thing about this is just showing how this bed looks in the landscape. This is a landscaping bed system where you raise the profile of the bed. I got excellent drainage in this bed. I don't have to worry about it. This bed is drip irrigated. Uh, I don't use irrigation. I haven't had to use irrigation on it but once this year because the year has been enough rain to keep it going. Once we get this building in place and use the right plants in a planting guild, which I'll talk about just in a second, then you'll, you'll build a system. This is a really, really easy, sustainable landscape system that these plants work well together. They help each other. They, they build together. Uh, I get a few peaches off the peach tree, but I also, has, I also have an orchard here to the right hand side where that one peach tree I let it grow bigger because I let the birds have that as peat because I want birds in the garden to help kill some of the insects. So that's that we're all works together in a big system. That's a whole different that's a whole different class. We can't do that today. But this is what it looks like. This is an acceptable landscape, right? Using sheet mulch method. You can absolutely use this method. I have I have been I have helped the environment with this bed. I have not done one thing to deter from the environment. I brought in more insects, I brought in birds, I brought in rabbits, I brought in all kinds of things in the garden. And I am helping Mother Nature. I'm building more trees to help put oxygen in there. Plus, I'm not wasting any water on this whatsoever. So, okay, next one. Hugo Coulter, one of the ones that are that are some. This is misused and misunderstood so much out of this. This is a, in, in a, under the umbrella of permaculture, and it's basically a core a mound. It's German for mound planting, and it's a it's a wooden core system. This system, when it was developed and when it was starting to put into play, was to reforest, uh, basically reforest areas that have been that have been limited, that have been uh, destroyed through agriculture and through uh, through mismanagement of human being, mismanagement of forested areas, and, and then it kind of grew into a food thing. Let's repopulate. Let's put these particular systems into areas of food need that we know we could grow a system in here and make this work. It's a wood core system. As you see this side cut of this, this is a beautiful side cut of how it is. You'll see different shapes. You'll see the rotted cores are in the middle. And what, what happens is as that breaks down, it will feed the soils and obviously build, build nutrients into the soil. But what it also does is, as it is, it acts as a sponge. It collects a lot of water when it rains. And, and, and this is in deserted areas that don't, that don't really get a lot of rain. But when it does rain, the wood will collect the rain. It will leach it out slowly into the soil as it breaks down, and micro, you know, your your biome needs the soil moisture to be alive anyway. You can't you can't have a, a new a micro system in dry soil. It works in mul different multiple levels, and what the you plant fruit plants on it, fruit trees, different things like that. The true original purposing was a seven foot tall bed, and as you see, this is a six and a half foot tall bed as it's finished. Not practical in a backyard, but but practicality could be. That at the bottom layer of that, see the bottom layer of logs down there? What if you just laid that on your soil on top of your cardboard and just put soil on top of that, build it up to two foot? You could absolutely do that. We do that in the bottom of raised beds that are over two foot tall. If I've got a three foot raised bed, the bottom of that raised bed is going to be logs, and it's going to be logs of different sizes. You see the different sizes in there because what happens, anything, those logs that, that, the, that the cursor's on right now, that little three-inch diameter log still holds a pretty pretty valuable uh, amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and uh, it actually will hold some uh, potassium in it, whereas the bigger core doesn't hold. Bigger cores don't hold the nutrients anymore. Once you get past three inches, you lose nutrient holding capacity because there's no there'd be no leaves on that. That's just going to be the structure of the tree, so it doesn't need to exchange nutrients in it anymore. The nutrients exchange to the vascular system going into the limbs that would hold leaves, well, the leaves and the limbs that are holding the leaves, they still have core value of nutrients. So that nitrogen is still bound into that. 
and we'll release into the soil. You got to have multi multi sizes. This is perfect. Multi sizes, uh, old to new. You see some of the wood looks older than some of the wood looks more rotten. So they mixed it in there, which works perfectly. You just want to build different degrees of age, different degrees of sizes of wood. And you want to, uh, to let this thing break down naturally. You're going to add topsoil over it. You can put mulch in there too. You'll want some compost in it, the way they've layered it here. And then you'll just plant the fire out of that bed. You'll plant the trees, ground covering shrubs, uh, could be whatever grows in your area, but our bottom layer would be, uh, you know, some kind of strawberries or some kind of vining plants in this. The seven layers of the forest is part of permaculture, which you could look that up, but that would be how they would put one of these beds together. But, but I just want to show you the basic, bed itself because i've had these i've had homeowners want to use this system and they put a seven foot six foot mound in the back and, and it looks and they don't like it, it looks horrible because the wood does poke out as the soil builds into it and you got to build more soil onto it it's not practical for a homeowner it's extremely practical for an area that wants to grow food that has the space to do it but you can use this this you can use the actual practice the actual theorem of this is the wood core that's the theorem of this whole thing you could use that as your basic raised bed your basic raised bed, whether it's got a structure in it, whether it's a wooden box or whether it's just freelance, it would be under, it would be used with the sheet mulching as the bottom layer under sheet mulching. This would work perfect for it. It does work. It has, it has a basis in science, a strong basis in science. It's just you need to modify the application for urban use. Uh, works the, the whole idea of this also is to use a different planting, a plant guild into it. I'm not going to get into guilds, but basically what a guild is would be a tree, a shrub, a vine. Uh, ground cover plant plants that work symbolically with each other as they do in nature. Uh, no system, no, the system behind you see the behind this, you have a mixture of different types of plants in there that work together. Don't work against each other. One will do something for the other plants in the system. They all help each other and you, you, you have specific plant gills to work together. So a fruit tree, uh, a blueberry bush, a vining uh, blackberry, vining blackberry, you can make this a whole food garden if you wanted to, or you can make it a landscape garden either way. Okay, next. This is Ugo Coulter started, and I did that in the raised bed that you saw. Just wood, I started putting wood core in. We'll go through this real quick. That was just the the uh, the way it started with wood. I got the, I got the, uh, this is before I put the mulch down. I've got wood started where that's a, that's a, uh, Plum tree that fell, so I started using wood into that and started building a bottom. The bottom layer of that is wood. It is a, it is that Hugo Coulter uh, theory that works very well, and that way you don't have to waste as much water. It will sponge the water just the same way. You don't want it to stop the water flow to the bottom, so it's not solid like you're trying to solid layer it, but just put, put enough to, to cover the bottom and you'll be okay. Okay, next. Uh, this is a swell and terrace system. This is an in-ground system. If you wanted to raise your beds and 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 basically have long rows of, of farm or gardening, uh, we built a third of an acre down at Hatcher, down at the, the train station, gave us a third of an acre, gave a restorative farm a third of an acre. All the rows and beds laid out are just like this, where that whole area within that block, and this is a contained system. This is part of our teaching garden. But what very simply is that whole area right there, was composted with about eight inches of compost. Then we mixed it in with the soil, the existing soil. This is the only one time that I will actually break into the soil to mix into it. And that's what we did on this one. Uh, then we took the soil that was really heavily composted and we made beds themselves, the two ridged areas. That's the terrace system. And then in between the swells where the dips are, we actually got those down a little bit deeper to those. And then usually we want the swells at least a foot in the ground. And that is full, that's filled with mulch with a heavy walkway mulch or a heavy woody mulch. And that acts the same thing as the Hugo Coulter practice of being inside. We're putting the wood on the outside, basically to hold the water and it will leach water into the soils. Now we will never till this. This is a permanent row system. And this is more, it's called self composting. There's a couple different names for it. In 500 AD, it was called a ridge and furrow system or medieval times. It was ridge and furrow system in Europe. They, the same systems we re, re, we re uh, evaluate, but we don't, again, we're not tilling, but we're, we're making a permanent self feeding system. So if watering system, what we'll do, what we did was every time we trade the crop out on the row, we composted heavy and we put more row mulch into this. And this is just a small example because this is just our, our, uh, our school example, but those could be 100, 150 foot rows. Those are, those are just a, a little block section of this, what we're doing. 
But then we brought, then across the bottom, I don't know if you can see it, across the bottom, down each row, we ran a drip irrigation line, so it's drip irrigated. Uh, Built Healthy Soils does everything we wanted to do. Again, we raised our profile. We're up above the original soil, but this soil builds so quickly underneath, it gets very, very uh, deep. You build deep soil systems in this, but this is the way to go if you want row gardens. So if I've got a half an acre back there, I want to put row gardens in, this is the way you want to build a row garden to be uh, to be eco-friendly, to be water-friendly. Uh, uh, this is was right in the middle of the other bed. So where all the grass is, that is now a foot of mulch. And that's why the system, that's why the pictures didn't look like the beds were that tall because we put a foot of mulch in there too to, to uh, capture. That was our rain capture. If you ever heard of, of rain gardens, the rain garden principle we're using is above ground, not below ground. We're using the same principle to capture water as it, as it proceeds to the, through the topography. So we're capturing water as it's going down the hill. We're not letting water get out in the street. We're capturing water before it gets there. But this is a good system to go if you want row gardens. Grow a lot of food on the system, and it's self, pretty much self-contained. You will have to water and drought, obviously, but vegetables are a little different. But this is really more of a vegetable, uh, an actual plant, uh, a food production garden. So next. Next. Okay, self-watering systems, wicking systems. Helen mentioned this to me, and I wasn't sure. Sip threw me off because it's. Uh, I know the garden is. I just I just never called it the sip garden. So this is a self-watering system where you're containing. You actually raise bed is contained in a plastic uh, cover, leak-proof cover. Uh, this is this is one step closer to hydroponic system because you're you're, you're capturing water in a, in a contained area on the bottom. The bottom picture shows it a little better where you've got these drain pipes and you've got the plastic coating. So the water that comes into it, you water it through the bucket on the top end of it. There's a water fountain, that water bucket there. And it, if it rains, of course, it gets in there too. But this is how you keep the water in the system. You don't let the water get over the pipe system. And you'll put a screen to where the soil doesn't get down into that. You need a clean system there. But the soil itself, the water is always wicking up into the soils. You can buy these. You can buy these particular kits at a home center. They have a home center. I, I saw a kit before. It's about two by two. that has a little the same system, same water sprout, same thing. So you can buy these kits. These kits are buy or you study it and you can build them. Uh, are, they, are they better than other systems? Not really better. They're just different ways to water and what you're going to do. If you're in a drought, you're going to have to put water in it anyway. So you're not going to save yourself to never, you can't say I never have to water, put water in it because long periods of droughts, which we have here, you know, if we get, if we get a month and a half of drought, there's not going to be water left in this bed. It's going to be used by the plants. So you have to rewater, but it's not watering as much. And you, you have to monitor to make sure that your water, your plants are getting enough water. You also have to make sure you're going to have to water over the top to get the plants established, to get the root system down. As the root systems grow down, they'll, they'll seek the water levels and they'll start pulling water up. They'll pull water up into their system. Part of it will be released through the leaf, through transpiration. So they'll sweat out the top, but also they're released back through the roots if they get over, over, uh, you know, when the water comes out, the, root, the roots will release moisture back in, too. So it's a good release. It's a, it's a neat system to do. Maybe a, this would work maybe great on a patio, too. If you've got a patio area or a blocked area, too, you could use this kind of system in there. But look it up. Check it out and see, if, see what you think about this system. There's, there's more mechanics to this system than the other systems because everything has to be in place or it won't work. And you've got drains on the side here, so it doesn't – so it's got to drain at a level. At that top one, on the top picture – if you look on that bed to the very left-hand bottom where the leg is, right, right to the right, just a bit up a little bit, you'll see a little bitty pipe sticking out of it. Up, 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 straight up, straight up. That's a drain right there. See that little drain? It's got a little drain pipe that comes in, so the water will only get to a certain level, then it drains off the top. It's like a French drain underneath, if you know what a French drain is. So it'll drain it out of that hole, and that's where it seeps out of the hole. So cool system, usable systems. Uh, Check them out and see if you like those, but that's a self-water and wicking system. Okay, next. We're almost done, guys. If you hang in just a few minutes, this is a lot of subject matter, and I wanted to make sure we get through it and be able to answer your stuff. So we're going to be here just a couple more minutes. Absolutely. Uh, Jeff, we had a question about uh, okay. like Oyas. Yeah, I'm about to get it. Yeah, we're about to get into irrigation. So this is the okay. part where we press. Yeah. Oya pots, I explained those. But drip irrigation systems can be timed. Uh uh, they can be on a the clock. They can be part of your irrigation systems. Uh, well, I'm not, I won't go too much into it, but I want to go through the, through the different types of systems you can use in this. So if you go to the next one, let me see what I put on the next one. If I put the right slide in, I might not have put it in. Okay. 
this is okay. This is building drip irrigation systems. This is plumbing into the system. You can see the top left hand where they have a rain barrel for each raised bed. Great thought, great theory, but in summer, you're not going to have any water in those barrels unless you fill them up, so they'll be empty. But it's a, it's a thought, thought process of, of trying to capture water, trying to be water-wise, trying to, trying to help the environment, trying to capture water. That's the way to go, and that's what we want to look at. Uh, the bottom is just some plumbing. The right hand is drip irrigation grids in the beds themselves. That is at uh, Arcadia Park Elementary School in South Dallas. You see the grids. The sticks in there are actually where the kids are going to plant. They're actually they're planting sticks for their own little plant. But the drip grids are actually right there. Every foot on that little plastic pipe has a has a, 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 a emitter in it that opens up when it gets water pressure, drips water slowly, about a gallon per hour. Uh, these beds would be watered normally in the summertime, generally about 10 minutes each on the system, and that'd be plenty to saturate the bed. That's a drip system going into it. In the same systems, we could use – in schools, we've used Oya type pots. Now, Oya pots are great to use. Uh, Oya is just a, a, a pot with a – it's a clay, a lightly fired clay pot that when you fill it up, if you just set it on the sidewalk, you'd fill it up and you'd see it start to sweat, and it leaches water back out of it because it's not hard fired. It's, it's very porous. And you bury that pot up to the rim, and you'll fill that with water, and you'll have that. That would be throughout this planting bed where you have a couple oyas for probably two oyas or three oyas for four by eight bed, and you have them right in the center so it would leach water out and you keep them filled up. Works great, but being slightly fired, the clay would break down pretty quickly, so you, you, it would bust out in a few seasons. You have to really check it because if it's busted, it doesn't work. You need a contained, you need a container of water below soil that leaches that leaches back into the soil very slow, very slowly. Over a period of a few days or a week, if you can. A week, it doesn't usually last that long, but a few days. In schools, we didn't have money. These were just barely enough to scrape by to get what we did because I work with all Title Ones. And what we do is we take a milk jug, and we take a milk jug fill and bury it till it's, till it's top. You bit little prick, little pinholes in it, and you, you different. You can't can't be a nail hole. Nail holes are too big. It has to be small enough to where the water just leaks out, and you'd have to test that yourself. But we 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 bury the cartons in there, and that would basically be for the weekends. So on Fridays, the kids would water the the uh, put their water in the in the milk jugs, fill them up in the garden. We probably have six or eight milk jugs in that garden right there, and then plant around them. And you would come in and and. By Monday, they would still hold enough water so you didn't have to lose them in, in, in hot weather where you weren't there in the weekends if you didn't have drip systems. Now, this is excluding the drip system. This isn't the same. Drip systems are extraordinarily efficient and work wonderfully if you can afford to do it. But most of the schools I work with, most of the people I work with can't afford to do any of this. So we've got to have alternative methods, and that's one method to go. Uh, there's a new. There's also uh, in the market, there's nipples. There's actually uh, drip nipples which you can put on the bottom of a two liter bottle and it's, it leaches out a, a gallon an hour and it could be screws on. You fill up a two liter bottle, you put the nipple on it, you turn it upside down, put the nipple down into the soil and it releases slowly. Those are also good for pots. If you're going to leave on a few days and, and you got pots that you've been watering, you know, in summertime we have to water our containers two, maybe two times a day, sometimes three in the wind, depending on what you've got in that pot. Those are you very useful in that, in the potted situation where you just take a, Two liter, put the nipple on it, turn it over, and let it uh, let it slowly leach into there, and that works really well for that. But different types of irrigation methods. We just want the irrigation to be very slow. We want to drip systems to save water. We want drip systems because I don't want water in between those beds. I don't want water to leach out in between the beds. Sometimes that's only depending on how good our soil is. That could be a five minute water for those beds on the right hand side. That's it. That's all we do. Five minutes on there. I want to saturate the bed. I want to saturate the root system but I don't want that pathway watered. In this school, we didn't have the money to be able to do the, the mulch in there, but eventually that was what we wanted to do. The middle picture is basically, the middle picture is the first, was part of the first picture you saw us plumbing in. That's the plumbing going underneath. And that plumbing was where the drip system hooks up, the drip grids, and then we've covered it, and then we covered it with a foot of mulch after that. So bottom right-hand side is just one of mine. So, okay, next. I have this is this is part of another class system we could do later is irrigation all kinds of all these can be broken up into segments of different ways we different things we do in the garden but this is kind of an overall I want to do an overall on, on race beds for you this is Arcadia Park again same picture I don't know why I've got it twice the picture in the middle top that is park that is uh, Parker Elementary and they they spelled out the word Parker in the raised beds 
and that's actually that's irrigated and we irrigated that one that was wrapped irrigation you see the cardboard around it that's the a of parker you see the cardboard around it uh the, the parents did this they had some they really did a lot of work on this one to make it work but they did it themselves got the wood uh they they did all this work all i had to do is go and taught them how to put it together taught them the practices and principles but they're very flexible you can see that you can make them into letters you can make them really neat make them very formal in a formal garden. These work wonderfully in stone or in brick in formal gardens. And, and it's just so, so, uh, so uh, uh, very adaptable to what your situation is. In the bed to the right-hand top, one other thing, you'll see us digging. Uh, that is uh, Mark Twain, I think, elementary. That's the kids digging. You see to the left-hand side, one thing about working with school kids in this, third, these are third graders, okay? So basically when I'm dealing with a group of third graders, I will add another four or five hours to the job, knowing that they're going to help me and they're going to be there and they're going to have to kind of watch them. Uh, four or five hours for third graders, eight hours for middle school kids because they're heading somewhere else, and two days for high school kids because their their mind is nowhere to be found mostly. So you got to if you're working with kids, remember that this is from experience of a long time that add time onto the kids. The younger the kids are, the less time you add because the more they're going to listen to you for the most part. But those are that left hand bed is a you see that's a raised bed. It's a foot tall at the bottom. And well, on the first picture, on the picture on the right hand side, right hand top, you'll see the, the left bed right there. You'll see there's another frame there. See the frame on top? That's a little deeper for carrots. They wanted to plant carrots and they wanted to plant some, some onions and things and garlic. So that's what that is for. We actually split that bed. So half the bed is only 12 inches, the other half is another four inches tall. So we split them. You can do that, split them up. This is just them putting irrigation in. That's the drip system irrigation with the plants in the middle at the bottom. And on the end of a drip irrigation system, see that, see the green right there? You always want a flush valve. That's your little flush valve. You just tie it in, and that way you can flush your lines, and that way your lines won't get clogged up. That's, that's simplistic, but that's, that works very, very well. Okay, next one. Okay, well, this is my – that's it for that's it for this presentation. These are all raised beds. Uh, these are all uh, – that's the vegetable bed. You see the bottom. There's my information, my email. You can certainly get a hold of me, uh, email me. Uh, the help desk goes to the help desk and it would go through our system. But if you need me, that's my email. Right hand tops of chicken coops. That's a raised bed, different application. This is our herb bed and our demo gardens. You saw you saw the picture where they're laying the car the cardboard on the grass and they were just now putting it with the tractor. That's the end result. That's the new bed this year. We put that in last year. This is one year old and it works wonderfully well the way we did it. And that's a stone bed. The top are just collards that we did in the demo garden. But hopefully this helped you all a little bit. I want to thank the group again. Certainly my friend Helen and the public library, Dallas Public Library, for letting me be able to visit with you a little bit. I hope this helped a little bit. Well, Jeff, I think this was fantastic. Um, I have. A, do you have some tomato varieties you recommend? And when Jeff answers that, uh, well, let's go ahead and launch our poll. So if you guys don't mind answering the poll questions, it's just to help us with some feedback and uh, with future programming. And then Jeff, I want to show you something after all the stuff you shared with us. So what are your tomato recommendations? Okay. Uh, what I use is I use, I'll use, right this year I'm going to use three different types. I use early girls for an earlier tomato. Tomatoes, determinate or indeterminate will be the first thing I want to choose. Do I want one that's going to be a vine or don't want a bush? If I've got a container garden, that's a contain true container, not a raised bed, but a container garden. I might want to put bush tomatoes in there, which would be determinate tomatoes. So anything I go would be, I'm looking for a variety that's either says patio or bush on it, and it will grow. It will grow determinate. It'll be a three foot tall, two and a half foot wide, but won't get any bigger than that. It'll set all of its tomatoes at one time. If I'm looking for just vining tomatoes, where I'm going to know I'm going to have to put either a cage or a trellis on, then I'm going to use a, a indeterminate called indeterminate tomato. It'll be on the tomato tag. It's going to be a tomato vine. I'm going to have to give it some structure, but I'm going to get a lot more tomatoes over a longer period of time off of a vine than I do off of a bush. But it's just on that for just what tomato use you want to do. Tomatoes are categorized into different categories. There's a, there's a, 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 a Roma tomatoes would typically be a saucing tomato means it has very little jelly in it would be great for your sauces. If you want to use it for sauces, uh, there's different, the other types, Early Girl, Better Boy, Celebrity, those are good slicing tomatoes where if I sliced it, put it on a piece of, you know, put it on a sandwich, it wouldn't be too wet. 
but there's a lot there's a, the, the heirloom varieties typically now these are these are all hybrids heirloom would be something that's a good tomato to use you're not going to get as many they're going to they can have more pest issues for the most part if you're not careful with what you're choosing they're going to be bigger meaty juicy great tomatoes great flavor more acidics to sweetness in them uh, that's going to depend on what type of tomato you want to use and there's the, that's the types we do cherry tomatoes work great for salads use that first think about that first when you're picking a tomato so when I go to varieties of tomatoes instead of top, that was tops of tomatoes. When I go to varieties of tomatoes, I want to use a short, I want to use one tomato that's going to be pretty short to harvest. Early girls at 49 days is the shortest harvest tomato. It'll say it on their days to harvest 49 days from, from the plant spiking and taking off from when you put a transplant in the ground. In 49 days, you will be harvesting tomatoes in theory. And if you got everything in place and you fertilize it and do everything right, that's a good starting one. So I'm going to plant some early girls, knowing that I'm going to get those first. I will plant a celebrity maybe in the middle. Celebrity is a very high disease-resistant tomato uh, plant, and it's a 70-day tomato. So it's going to be 70 days coming out of it. So that's going to be my middle tomato to carry through the middle of the season. And then I might plant a Marzano or a Roma to get a different type, but that's usually can be up to an 80-day, an 85-day tomato. It's going to be succession to where I'm going to have tomatoes all through a longer season, but I'm also going to have a couple different types of tomatoes. I can have a saucing tomato on one end, or I can have a nice early girl slicing tomato on the other end. I think there's registered 10,000 varieties of tomatoes on the on, in worldwide registrations. That's true. That's just how many is in it's Johannesburg. There's registration in Johannesburg. There's 10,000 varieties registered. Uh, and they're all over the place. I, I think what you should look at is the type first and then days to maturity second, because that's what you want to look at. And then the varieties within those groupings will just be, you take, a, if you want a, you want a purple tomato, you want a green tomato, you want an orange tomato, uh, you want a pink tomato. There's all different colors of tomatoes you can use to make it kind of neat for the kids or neat for different salad mixes. One's not going to be more uh, for the, for, for, Generally, basic one's not going to be more flavorful than the other. They got to carry different flavors in a different way. They they set their acidics in it, but they're still going to be a million times better than the store bought tomato. I promise you, they're going to be much better than what you buy in the store. But look at look at disease look at the disease resistance is what you want to choose out of your group. If you say for varieties, there's multiple plants out there in each type of tomato. Say your sauce tomato or your sandwich tomatoes. There's multiple types that have lots of disease resistance. This is part of best practice. The more disease resistance having a plant, the less spray I would ever have to use on that plant and the less, pro the less problems I'm going to see in the plant. So look for disease resistance, type the tomato you want, and then uh, then choose within that variety. There's a large catalog on each variety that you can choose. But choose an early, a middle, and a late bloomer or maturity, and I think you'll have a long season, a longer season. Long answer for a short question, but tomatoes are pretty pretty amazing. That's the number one plant. That's the one that everybody wants to know about, and that's one that we have a lot of variety on. That's absolutely true, you know, and I didn't think about like them being, you know, juicier or drier for slicing versus sauces. I personally grow a lot of grape tomatoes, like the yellow pear-shaped ones. Mm -hmm. I seem to have a lot of luck with yep, those, they and they seem to have a little less disease, but you're right. I'm not, those aren't the best kind, like, to put on a sandwich. So you're absolutely right that, you know, how you want to yeah. use them is a good way to think about which ones to grow, because if you're not using it and you're growing it, it's taking space in your garden for something else. So you're absolutely right. Uh, so, okay, so Jeff, yep. I wanted to show you something as an idea. Uh, we were talking about the Oya pots, right? And you mentioned that the, they can be very expensive mm -hmm. to buy large Oya pots, right? So yes, uh, what if you took a clay pot, like a regular one, and you put, you sealed the bottom and you sealed the inside. And what I did is mm -hmm. I used a mounting putty, which uh, if you're old school like me and Jeff and you, when you went to college, you had to use this to put posters on your wall because you had cinder block walls in your college dorm. Yeah, it might be did. different now. There, there. So back, back in my time, this is what we had to use. It was a mounting putty, okay? So I sealed yeah. the top and the bottom, and I could bury this in my garden, right? And it's the you same could. kind of clay as an Oya, and I can fill it with water. But of course, I need a lid, right? I don't want to have evaporation loss or insects maybe falling in there and drowning and stuff like that. So you could get a saucer and you can actually mm -hmm. put this on top and make your own inexpensive Oya. What do you think? Do you think it'll work? <laughs> it's the same thing. You just got to, you just want to make sure it's not, it doesn't have any kind of 
any kind of slacking coating on it. You want to make sure it's just pure clay. Absolutely, it will work. It'll, it'll, it'll release slowly. Test it first. Fill it up. Put it on the sidewalk. Put your top on. See how it leaches. Make sure you got a leaching pot that is leaching well through there. You could absolutely do that. I mean, this is – oils are just slightly fired. They're fired less than that pot. That pot will last longer in the ground than it would. You can absolutely do that. This is not restricted. This is this is limited to what you have and limited only to your imagination on how you want to use this. All these will work. It's just getting water to the root system. We're not watering. The, I don't want to water pathways. I don't want to water sidewalks. I don't want to water the street. I don't want to particularly not all the time water the kids, although sometimes that's fun to get water on the kids when they're out there. But I, this is this is what I want you guys to understand is that. When, when I teach, it's all from the basics of science, but the, the practicality of it is, but the, but the actual mechanics of it is not particularly. How you work this and how you make this work. There's lots of different ways you can, you can a, lot of, a lot of times, and what we're doing with the new gardens now is we're taking logs. We're finding logs that are cut off the side of the street, and that's our edging for our raised beds. Well, logs make a wonderful edging for raised beds, absolutely beautiful, natural in the landscape, and free when they're on the side of the road. And the, the stone is very expensive. Stone is wonderful and beautiful, but it's expensive. So I want you to get the best way you can with the best materials you can, knowing that you've got limits on money to use. A lot of this is in nature. Nothing looks more natural in a garden than wood and stone. It's part of, it's part of the environment. And, and that's what we're doing with that new, the garden you saw there with the stone. Uh, with the, the actual only part of the stone will be the stone herb garden that you saw. The rest of it's lined in, in just big pieces of organically shaped wood we found on the roads. The people cut their tree down, we're taking that wood, we're making sure it doesn't have termites and clean, but we're taking it in and they're just making beautiful line beds. I want it to be wiggly, I want it to not be perfect because that's not a formal garden. Think about things like that. You, that was a great example. There's all kinds of things you can use to make this work. You just gotta, just gotta use your imagination. Go, go and study the basic of what the principle is, why this works and what you're trying to do, but how you apply it it's going to be up to you and how you want to make it work. That's, that's what I definitely, we had different, you know, so five that was great. Words, Thank you. Five words, yeah. Jeff. And then also yeah. if this happens to work for you, like Jeff said, the good thing to do is do the sidewalk test to make sure it is leaching the water is if you have a smaller saucer, you can actually fit it on top like this. Right. And look, you can actually provide water for pollinators. You can turn this into a little pollinator watering station, putting some stones or floating corks in here to encourage pollinators to come to your garden. They can have a little bit of drink. And then, you know, when this water on the top gets low, that's probably when you need to fill up your, your, your new oil. So I want to thank you, Jeff, Absolutely. so much for your time and expertise. You shared a wealth of information with us. I'm excited to like go out there and do my raised beds right now. So, and uh, I want to thank everybody for attending. Uh, thank you for sharing your time with us. Um, we appreciate um, your interest in uh, helping Dallas grow. Next week, we have a program. It's going to be a, a little bit different. It's called Invite the Three Sisters. We're going to talk about Three Sisters Stew from Native American cultures and a little bit about how you grow three sisters um, in your garden and the method of that type of gardening. Uh, and to see if this, if you want to incorporate this into your Thanksgiving or try that three sisters growing method in your garden coming up. So Jeff, uh, on cool. behalf of you and the Dallas Public Library and Dallas Environmental Quality and Sustainability, we thank you so very much. And um, also That's Vanessa it. hosts a, a garden talk program and it will be, is it tomorrow at noon? It's tomorrow at noon, there's a link there and it's just a open session. You can come in and ask your gardening questions, share ideas, thoughts, even pictures and all sorts of things like that. And it's a really nice time to get to network with other gardeners and uh, ask your questions. And also- and three, sisters, the link three, sisters is actually, three Sisters is actually, Three Sisters is a plant guild. That's what a plant guild is. Plants working together to build. That's one of the early plant guilds. So, so watch that. That's really neat because that's how plant guild works. That's how plants work together. Yeah, we're really exciting to have that. And there's a link for that in the chat too. So uh, everyone, thank you so much. And hopefully we will see you either tomorrow or next Monday. Thank you guys. Thank you.